what's up? Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the program. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today's guest, everybody, is Sean White. Just kidding. Mark McMorris, the new face of snowboarding. This guy, wow, I don't know where to start other than, wow. The dude's been through really everything at a young age. 25, 17 X Games medals, two Olympics, two Olympic medals. Although not gold, you know, the guy came off some pretty pretty heavy injuries is an understatement. Total catastrophic, insane injuries. And that just shows Mark's um, perseverance to get back on the board. This dude's, this guy loves snowboarding. He does whatever it takes so he can be back on his snowboard. And unlike the last guy who was the face of snowboarding, Mr. White, who's building half pipes to ride by himself so he can beat everybody. Um, Mark actually snowboards with everybody else who's competitive and he films video parts with everybody else who films video parts. And he, he, he's intertwined in the community. And I got a lot of respect for that. I do. You know, Sean was doing everything to win, but at the end is winning that coup. If you're not winning with a bunch of homies and hanging out with your homies after, I don't know. You tell me. I've also seen what I've seen about Sean, and it just seemed like maybe he was doing it for the wrong reasons. Although, I mean, when you are as big as Sean White, you get a clogged, you get a clogged vision. You get a foggy vision. Do you know who doesn't get a foggy vision? Is Mark McMorris, because this guy has been manifesting, and he knows exactly what he wants to accomplish with snowboarding. And he mentions on the podcast that this this has all been a product of what he's designed in his head. He has been manifesting this lifestyle since he was a kid. That, my friends, is the power of manifestation. I believe in it. I do. If you manifest what you want in life, you'll get it. Or at least you will get close to it. Or at least you will be headed in the right direction. Anyways, enjoy the podcast, ladies and gentlemen. We are back. Episode number, I don't remember because I haven't done one of these in a while, but I'm happy. I got a long... Well, we've been friends for a long time, but I just never see you anymore because of, you know, like what you achieved and stuff. We got Mark McMorris on the podcast. Nice to be here with you, Jody. Been a fan of yours for many, many moons. I've been a fan of yours since you were on, I think you were writing for Class 5 and O'Neill. Maybe that was the first, but actually no, but dates further than that. I've known you since when I was a kid, we were, I grew up in Winnipeg, Mark grew up in Saskatchewan. There was a place called uh i'm not sure if it's assisippi or holiday mountain there was a contest at one of those and i remember you and craig were in them and uh i I don't know maybe i won i'm not sure i'm not sure what happened there. yeah i think you might have i might have been like seven years older than you my fondest memory would have been you kuzik and jeeves coming to the jib fest in the city in regina you guys were probably really young but i was really really young and I was just starstruck. So nice to be here with you. Starstruck. I mean, yeah. I mean, Kuzik and Jeeves are pretty sick. You know, I was out there. I was probably sending it. I don't Dude, actually you're remember. You're sending it for sure. That's sick. Who? Oh, do you know who I think won that was Josh Voggs, like another homie of ours that um probably we met you back then as well. But that that dates back probably like 15, 16 years from now. I know. It's kind of crazy to think we've been standing sideways for that long standing sideways i was a, was that a burton project that was at one was that point, like a plug yeah. or that's just like standing no, sideways that's pretty standard that was the <laughs> second last movie burton made that was good you had a pretty sick section in that if i remember correctly thank you very much was it like i think there is like a seven minute edit of you is that the section that you uh start with a method in the trees kind of and then you do a back 10 indie off that step down um i think that might have been 13. Okay. That was a dude. That back 10 indie was, fuck, I think you would have hit that jump with Mickle. Yep. Yeah. That back 10 indie you did was. That like, actually might have been in motion, actually, which was 
in 2015. And that was the first time I ever really got to consistently go in the Whistler backcountry with Mikey and Mikkel and Mark. And that was very, very monumental for me. Yeah, you stomped a lot. Dude, you, I remember bumping into Mikey after you had like, you guys had your big window. You guys were sending it. We bumped into Mikey and Leyland probably a week or two after you left. And we're like, how'd he do? And Mikey's like, oh, he landed lots of stuff. <laughs> I mean, you well, are out there with Mikey. Because they took me to good jumps and got me unstuck. If it was just me and a film crew, I might have been hooped. Oh, Thank yeah, God you would have been. and Mikey. You would have been hooped. That's just the way it was, though. That's, I mean, all of us, you know, you come to Whistler and then you hope that you get to bump into someone as knowledgeable in the Whistler backcountry as Mikey Rents. I mean, he's kind of the modern day Devin Walsh. Very much so. I he's, think that's a very appropriate title. Yeah, he's he's a secret weapon. He is a bit of a weapon. Yeah, he is. I've uh, I've grown very fond of Mikey. I was a huge fan, but he's he even uh, is cooler than you'd ever think. I actually um, I don't remember who told me this. Maybe it was Sheen. I could be wrong, but um, uh, Jake Burton had a quote about Mikey Rents that if I could be anybody on Burton, I'd be Mikey Rents. And that's when he first signed him, probably when Mikey was like 13 or 14, just with Mikey's personality and stuff. And I mean, you've got, gotten to know both of those guys really well. Um, and I mean, Mikey, his personality on and off the snowboard has been um, something that I, I just think it shine it doesn't shine enough in his video parts because if you meet Mikey, you are, I mean, dude, the way yeah. he dresses and everything like that, like hot damn. Yeah, he is. And Quite we can the do character. a character. Little... It's just unbelievable how long he's been snowboarding at the level he has been, and I spent a lot of time with him just recently at Jake's memorial, and it's crazy how long he's been on Burton and what what an asset to the brand he's been and how many years he's been sort of out of the half pipe and enjoying the mountains and how well he knows them and yeah he is a guy you would want to be he spends all his time in the backcountry riding good snow i feel like burton's really uh i don't know if it's fortunate but they pick riders very well that translate from contest to pow i mean you i mean you you yourself i mean you're still doing both you're at the top of the top of contests and you ride backcountry which i gotta say i have so much respect sounds like a dumb word but i, I love that you have enough appreciation for film you squeeze in full video parts while you're winning contests which i just have i just think that's so dope and there's a lot of burton riders that have done that trevor andrew i mean even you can go back to craig kelly like they all started in that contest scene, crushing it, and then they translate into filming. I mean, most of the like Nicholas Mueller. I mean, the list goes on and on and on with amazing Burton riders that turn out to be the best freestyle power. Mickel, like, yeah, Mickel is a huge example. Nicholas, Trevor, Mikey, Solers, even yeah, everyone, everyone kind of takes that path, and Burton supports people in that. So that's super, super badass on Burton's part. Yeah. I'm very, very fortunate to be a part of that brand. You, uh, there's a lot of talk out about Burton as a little kid, but when you start to be in that family and you realize what they actually do for snowboarding and what they do for their riders and athletes, it's pretty cool roof to be under. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, we got, we had a nice, we got a drink here. We can do a cheers to Jake yeah, for shaping that and bringing to you. I know you were uh, really close with him. He's uh, somebody that I wish I, I personally, um, I wish I had got to meet him. I ran into him once and I got to say, he's just like, his aura is bigger than snowboarding. He gives back in so many different ways. And I've only heard from anyone who has met him that um, even Jeff Pinciero at Bald Face, um, we had a little drink for him at Pat Moore's um, avalanche and um, safety course that pat puts on and we had a little cheers for jake and it was interesting to hear a lot of people at the lodge sh share a lot of stories and uh, i i don't know it's just one of those things that you're upset as being a, obviously i'm a snowboard nerd i have this podcast it's not being able to meet jake burton's a, a tough one so i mean yeah. cheers to jake cheers to jake stories stories for days about that guy he he left a lifelong met like or a lifelong lasting memory on anybody he met you know it's just 
like you said, his aura was bigger than snowboarding and the fact that he cared so much about snowboarding and even till the day he died, that was his main priority is making snowboarding more accessible and a better sport. And he changed millions of lives with what he did and most of those lives for the better. So pretty, pretty thankful that I got to know him on the level I did. It's really, really shitty that he left so soon, but he, he did a lot in those 65 years, more than most people could do in a thousand years. I could only imagine he would almost be like a, I don't want to speak for you, but like a father figure in some aspect while you're traveling, you know, helping you juggle. But for me, just seeing, cause I mean, your life's pretty well documented and uh, like, I follow you pretty heavily. I don't really follow all the, the, like those dudes in the contest scene as much as you, but I mean, not only do I jo- enjoy your, your riding, but like who you are. And I think people like Jake have really helped. I mean, maybe, am I right? Helped shape who you are today. And I mean, like, I think he's maybe helped you make a lot of the right calls. And he also didn't seem like he added all this pressure on you when you've been injured and stuff. Totally. I mean, like. I can vividly remember when he came to Vancouver after I hit that tree in 17 and we were just having lunch and he was like, hey, if you don't want to do this anymore, you don't have to. And I basically, in my broken ass state, punched him in the in the stomach and I was like, this is my life. I'm never going to stop doing this. And whether you guys support me or not, he was just so happy to hear that. And he, he knows how much appreciation I had for everything they did for me and have done and continue to do for me. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a sore subject right now, but I'm, it's good to talk about it. The guy was such, such a legend to everyone. And, uh, like you said, a father figure to me, a brother figure to me, and just like the best all around friend that is just crazy what he did and how much support he gave me and friendship he gave me. And yeah, it was just, I don't really know how to say thank you enough to him. And I wish I could repay him in, in so many different ways, but I guess it's just showing appreciation for snowboarding and giving back as much as I can. And I know he's proud of me, but it's, it's tough. For sure. I mean, we've all, most of the people who are probably listening to this podcast are probably, you know, a bit older, maybe 20 to 30. We've all lost people that we love that like have shaped us um, like Jake has for you. And um, I think when those people pass, all you can do is like, okay, this is what, this is what would make them proud if they were watching me right now. And then making those calls throughout your life. And then knowing that when you make those calls, that's what's making them the most proud. Totally. And, um, I mean, we can, uh, on the lighter side of things though, like Jake, he, um, before passing him and Donna put on this whole chill program, a way to give back to kids. I'm not sure uh, exactly what that program is. Can you shine a little light on that program that they have? I know you and Craig give a lot back with your foundation. Yeah. So the chill foundation is 20 years running already, which is pretty crazy to think about. And it's just helping inner kid, inner city kids find an escape and do something that makes them feel free and forget about what's going on at home, whether it's in LA skateboarding or surfing or around the Midwest or any inner city kid, they're taking them to the mountain or getting them involved in board sports nonetheless. And it changes their lives. It's unbelievable what snowboarding and skateboarding and surfing can do for somebody's overall well-being. It's very healing and It's very free spirited. So a lot of these kids never get to feel that. So it's pretty impressive how many lives they've changed through that foundation. And then Jake was super proud of me and my family for starting our foundation. And then when he started that mine 77 line, he gave me a board through it, um, a pro model board and every single proceed that came from it was donated to the McMorris foundation. And it's just, such a testament to what he stood for. So I was very honored and um, can't thank him enough for that. That's amazing that uh, that you and your brother have like at such young ages, I'm sure your mom and dad, um, I can just tell that they're incredible people by the two sons they've raised. But, um, you know, you guys starting your own foundation and giving back. Um, do you guys do the same kind of thing with uh, people in Saskatchewan? Um, is that what you do? You guys get people involved in board sports and kind of like, 
Yeah, it's it's really any any sport of their choice because Craig and I were super lucky that we could participate in any sport if it was hockey all the way to volleyball or soccer or baseball or whatever it was under the sun. We had the privilege of being able to participate in it and that shaped us more than anything. And obviously we chose snowboarding because we loved the free spirit aspect of it, but we're not pushing it on anybody. It's the money goes to these underprivileged youth and they get to pick the sport of their choice. And that makes us feel most whole. We don't want to pigeonhole anybody into anything. So we give them the opportunity. And if it's travel needs or travel funds or equipment, you know, whatever it may be, we're there for them. And we've been able to help hundreds and hundreds of kids across Saskatchewan and hope to move across Canada soon, but we're growing every year and it's a, it's a feel good project and feels good to feel good. Hot damn, dude. Thank you. Thank, Thank God you, people Jody. are still giving Thanks back. Thanks for shining light on the McMorris Foundation. Yeah. Cheers to the McMorris cheers. Foundation. I mean. Cheers to anybody giving back. Yeah. It doesn't need to be a foundation can just be giving gear to a kid that doesn't have anything or whatever it may be. I know you do the same with your Mary or what's your event called in, uh, 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 it's called the King of the Hill. King of the um, Hill. Yeah. Spring Hill. It's at Spring Hill Winter Park. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's whatever level and there's no judgment on level. It's just as long as you give back because Jody and myself, like we've been so fortunate to be able to live out our dream and we got to give every other kid the opportunity in any way we can if it's a pair of headphones or if it's if it's funds it's crazy to think that i i feel like people like us you know you're from Saskatchewan i'm from Winnipeg there's no mountains around there that's really a testament to like kids need to realize that if they manifest something if they believe in something you know once we give them like you know you set them up with a camp i give them a board i just don't want those small towns or maybe small towns is a you know maybe not the correct term, but like people who tell people that to like have a limited belief on like what they can achieve when they're not from something where everyone's just going after their dreams. Like if you are tuned into this, like realize that like, if you want to be a pro hockey player, you want to be a golfer, you want to be the next Mark McMorris. I mean, like the only one standing in the way is you. And I mean, like, I, you got, obviously it's like a long road ahead of you and you might not even achieve that, but you're not even going to come close if you don't start trying. So I'm just a huge, uh, I have had Rasmin on a podcast two, two times ago, and I was actually doing a little bit of YouTube searching on you. And I, I heard in a few of your interviews that you were talking about, like how, like when you're in that drop in and you're, whether you're at the Olympics or you're chasing your 16th or 17th X games medal, like you want, you have to manifest it. Like you're not, th you're not seeing anything but a positive outcome of you doing that trick and you've been manifesting it your whole life. And I mean, hell, look where it's taken you. Totally. Even I'm taking notes on that. Thank you so much. And it is total manifestation. Obviously, if you're human, negative thoughts will pop into your head, but it's throwing those to the side and visualizing what could come of it. And yeah, it doesn't matter where you're from. And usually if you're from a more challenged place for the sport you're maybe trying to succeed in or the job title you may want, if we're talking broad spectrum, it's literally up to you. You can do it. And if you have the passion for it, it's totally achievable. And that speaks to the amount of prairie riders that made a living off snowboarding. It's crazy. We don't have it, so we want it. And even if you have it, you can get it. But I'm just saying that if there's adversity, you can overcome it. And it's, it's just a little bit more motivation or fire under your ass, if you will. Totally. I mean, if you come from something where you don't have snowboarding or whatever, I think snowboarding, skateboarding, surfing, you can throw moto, whatever, into that category. Once you do that and you're alone, whether it's on like the, the a mini ramp or you're skating a box or you're going to try a backlip on the rail, once you realize the freedom of that like creativity, it's so addictive. I, I felt like I never knew that when I – like I grew up playing soccer – basketball like structured sports which nothing against them i still have a good time playing all those things like i love hockey and stuff but there's something about where there's nothing in the way between like you and this obstacle it's just you it's just like and then you can throw 
like whoever influences you, you can throw your style on that. And then once you start biting all your favorite snowboarders, favorite skaters, and you start stealing little pieces of style, it just like gets more and more and more exciting. And it, I mean, damn, that shit's addictive. It is addictive, man. It's, it's unbelievable. And I'll tell this story again. I've told it many times, but I was playing super competitive hockey when I was about 12 years old. And competitive hockey in Saskatchewan is a whole different beast or just along the prairies. Like there, there are more NHL players per capita from Saskatchewan. So hockey is very serious where I come from. And one time I'm playing AAA hockey and I forget my neck gate or my neck guard and I have to skate laps the whole practice. And then I realized, I think I'm going to snowboard for the rest of my life because no one's telling me how to do it. There's no rules about it. There's nothing that I don't like about snowboarding. And from that day on, I chose snowboarding because it's literally the most free and it's an expression of how you feel. And you can totally take influence from so many different aspects of board sports or people you look up to. And that's what makes action sports what it is today and it's it some will say it's super rebellious but it really is just a freedom of speech and a freedom of action and it makes you feel whole straight up couldn't agree anymore so out of curiosity young mark mcmorris you're in your bedroom you got trans world you got snowboarder mag you got the new thrasher what who are you cutting pictures out of who are your dudes growing up skating snowboarding gave us a handful of guys that were like those are the guys that's like their methods, whatever, that you were into. Totally. When I was super little, um, we didn't have a ton of jumps or anything where I grew up. So I was super into the rail riding scene. I looked up to Lucas Magoon like crazy. I loved Andrew Jeeves. I loved anybody that I could almost touch. You, Jake Kuzik, all these people. I looked up to you guys so, so much. And that made... That made sense to me. It was someone that I could almost see. Aero Etela was a huge one for me. I got that Mac Dog movie. And follow I was me just, around? Follow me around. And we had a Honda Odyssey and everywhere we would drive, I would watch Follow Me Around. Aaron Bittner. I was a huge fan of Bittner. Shouts to Bittner. Love that Bittner's, guy. Yeah, that's a big um, one for me too. Lucas Magoon as well. Yeah. I just remember watching that stuff over and over and over again. And it seemed so far-fetched, but now these guys are all our friends and it's just so bizarre to think about. I was obviously really into Travis Rice and all these amazing athletes like Andreas Wig. And even when I was a little kid, Sean White was the man to me. And Dude, he's, the a, white he's, album? A, he's a friend to me now and I'm still inspired by his work. The guy's incredible. He's one of the best board sports athletes to ever roam the earth. And, and it's just, so weird to think that like a kid from Saskatchewan can reach that level you know so adversity is literally in your head that's, that's all. amazing that you got influenced but uh, you know what though I totally agree growing up in Winnipeg me Jake Jeeves our little crew Gypsy Mob have you ever heard of that name Gypsy Mob Gypsy Mob I've seen the flicks dog. oh yo sick. Derek Mo Demo yeah Sanya okay our whole crew same thing, like, you know, we're buying all the movies, we're watching the Bittner, the Lucas Magoon, the, like, the love-hate movies, we're just scrolling through that stuff, and we're skipping pow parts for the most part. I mean, unless you're Devin or Mark Frank, we, it just, like, wasn't our shit, you know, same thing as you. it was you unobtainable. We never seen it, we never felt it, never been a part of it, but we all had down rails in our backyard. Straight up. That's what it was for us. And then you go out, and then I started going out west, and like my friend Kevin Griffin was riding a lot of pow. Oh and my they, god, Kevin yeah. Griffin, another huge OG. Yeah, K, KG, that's a, that's a sick toss out for anyone who was in the middle of Canada. Kevin was kind of like the first dude, you know, before Jeeves, he was going to Super Park as like a young kid. He was on Oakley, yeah. you know. He had like his own outerwear company called Red Baron. Yeah, that was <laughs> RBA. Kevin Griffin's outerwear. <laughs> RBA was Kevin Griffin's company. Oh, man. man but then you like, go to the mountains and then you start riding POW and stuff and then you get those parts. You get like, you know, Travis Parker and David Benedict and you're like, like whoa, my God, like this is Lucas Huffman grail. and you're like watching all these dudes like, whoa, powder's cool, like Sheen Campus. You're not skipping those parts anymore. You're like, you have a connection, but if you're in the middle of Manitoba. You just want to see someone backlip the kink. Yeah, that's 
That's truth right there, Jode. Cheers to the prairies. Cheers to the prairies. First and foremost. Thanks for the tequila. Cheers to the West. We're very grateful we get to experience the POW now, and we realize how much more fun that is than riding metal at times. Yes. And they're both beasts in their own sense, but... God, I as I get older, I really, really, really appreciate the mountains and and snow conditions and all that. It's, but then you go up there and you see the jib yard and you're like, this is pretty badass too. This was all I cared about as a kid and seeing a hundred kids in line and hiking these rails. It's like, okay, wow, this is still a thing, and this is what's so obtainable to kids because they can go to the resort or they can set up a rail in their backyard and. Um, that's where everyone mainly starts. And everyone grew does up in the box in the backyard, dude, I was watching some of your old stuff. Um, well, I remember all these shots, but I forgot about them. So I was digging them up in the old YouTube videos, but you have this, this, like, there's like kind of this iconic kind of like uh, structure in the middle of Saskatoon or one of those places, Regina, and you're doing, you do like a back blunt, a 270, a front blunt, 270. It's like a concrete out pillar and you're kind of gapping to it. Yeah, you switch tail two seven, front blunt two seventy, oh, yeah. and back blunt two seven. Yeah, and I I remember going there when I was a kid because we were me and like our whole crew was driving by that and we were like oh like there's no spots here and then sure enough two years later you film like a bunch of I think it was maybe for an O'Neill edit or something yeah, like that. Yeah, if you didn't Class have five. a winch in the prairies, <laughs> you were basically hooped. Not even a drop in would do you any good because there wasn't enough slope to have a steep enough down rail. So we were hitting the most random stuff, wall rides, cement ledges, flat rails. Dude, the flat rail that you session it, it, beside that building into the mini bank. Yeah. Dude, that that sesh is so sick. Every clip you film is into the bank. <laughs> Literally. And Craig Literally. Craig was super into that and helped me like be more into that because he would have been 16 and he had to still go to high school, which he'll talk about till this day and I was allowed to leave because I had support from a sponsor and I got to go see what like competing was like and jumping and being at these resorts and him and Adam Burwell would still be at home winching these spots and then I'd come back and I'd be like oh this is kind of whack I want to go ride like <laughs> bi- like not go to street. Big light. yeah exactly yeah. and Craig Craig was a huge advocate for me being in the street and he He's um, still at it. He's Dude, actually, isn't he filming with Anto right now for X Games? He's filming X Games Real Street for his sec- or third year in a row. Um, they're in Sudbury, Ontario, staying at the Travelodge. <laughs> <laughs> and it's his birthday today, so I know he, oh, no he way. wishes he was here with us. But um, well, we're drinking tequila for him. Yeah, It's we his are. favorite That's drink. That's what we're doing. Casamigos, we're doing him baby. well. Well, actually, let's go Salento. But All right, another cheers enough. here. We're happy to do that. So did Craig get you into snowboarding initially? Did you get him into it? Or was it you guys just start at the same time? Very same day, Lake Louise, Alberta, which is located in Banff. And we were renovating our home. And I don't know, my dad wasn't with us, but my mom took us out west. And we had received skateboards that summer from our neighbor. And she was about to put us in ski lessons. He, he was seven, I was five. And we said, we saw on the wall that these, these skateboards that worked on snow with bindings <laughs> and we we're like, we want to do that. <laughs> and then that, the rest is history. We, we started on the same day and coming from a challenge place like where we did, um, I didn't know a kid that was my age that snowboarded and Craig didn't know a kid that was his age that snowboarded. So without each other, pushing each other to learn new things, we would never be where we are. But from that day, we just loved snowboarding, loved skateboarding, and we just pushed each other to new limits to learn the things we saw in the movies. Dude, it, you know what's crazy is like, it, I've always kind of like, you know, you, you start achieving all this, you get on Red Bull, you're blowing up, you go to COC, you're starting to get like the, you know, all the tricks. And Craig was super sick, you know, just as good as the rest of us. But like you, you know, you had that that super genetic gene where you're just like, but Craig has really made a name for himself doing a, like, you know, he's an X Games real, like the street. He's a mate. He went in his whole other direction. He didn't try to do like the brother tag along. You were doing your own thing. He goes out there with us like man boys and films a full backcountry part, like starts 
Like that lip slide he does off the building onto that kink two years ago. Like Jesus, like he's making it. And he's juggling all that with, you know, being a complete professional and doing like, you know, CBC Olympic announcing. I just think that like, same thing with you juggling, doing contests and filming parts. I got to say, I have so much respect for your brother for doing the professional side of his life, but then also having that like deep inner passion of being a kid and still wanting to film a video part that the right people respect. You can tell that he want he like, you know, he's going out there and hitting spots that like, you know, LeWiff and, you know, Frank April and the people he probably looks up to probably like, he's probably like, I hope they're hyped on this clip. And I think a lot of people are because like, hot damn, dude, he's, he's been putting it on these last few years. Like, dude, damn, Craig, shout out to Craig. Yeah. Craig deserves everything he has. He's been, such a hard worker in the sense that he didn't have everything I had. He didn't get to leave high school early. He didn't have the sponsors right away, but he loved snowboarding equally as much as me. And then he came out West. He started working with John Swiston, getting in these movies. He got really good at snowboarding. He's incredibly funny. He's a great personality <laughs> and he, he got what he deserved in the end, you know? He he ended up being able to film with the man boys. He got those jobs with ESPN and he is such a beast in his own respect. And finally it's not overshadowed by my success. He didn't try and do the tag along thing, like you said. He went his own road and found his own niche, so to speak. And he's been incredibly successful in it. And it just makes me incredibly proud that my older brother is doing such great things in the same industry, but totally different from me. And um, yeah, like I said, I couldn't be more proud of him. And he's got a lot of respect from the snowboard community with what he's done in his movie parts and with his real street. And like, he's got an X Games medal. That's pretty bizarre. <laughs> that We're is shooting amazing. shooting this thing and he's like, We've got 18 X Games medals between the two of us. And like, that's that's a testament to Craig. He shines light on every situation. He's very humorous and he's very talented. Well, that's about the nicest thing I've heard a brother say on the podcast. Maybe the only thing, but hot damn, you two, you, exactly. You guys are doing your own thing and it's translating into amazing shit. Thank you so much. Yeah, you we got... love working together and that's the thing. We had that huge separation when I was 15 to I was 21 and it's fully came full circle. He went his way. I went my way and we've gained all this success. And then now we've come back together. He's on Red Bull. He's on Oakley. Yeah. And now we get to work together and we had a great year shooting the show. And it's just, I don't know. It's crazy how things came full circle in a tough industry to succeed a in. A very tough industry. So I'm, I'm, I'm you gotta find grateful. you gotta find your niche in this industry. You yeah. know what I mean? Like the, you can't, not everybody you can't copyright anything. Yeah. You like, gotta be your own person. Yeah, from every anything. I mean, pff, dude, look at that dude. What's young Dolly riding around in like pajama pants? Yeah. He literally has a pro model on Nitro. The first dude I've ever seen never film a video part. Just do his own thing completely. Pe like drink sexy, whatever he's doing. Like I I'm all for it, dude. That guy's just doing his thing. Yeah, and I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> and I'm just like mind blown by these people who are just following uh, their path. And especially with social media, you can really like shine your own light on what you think is tight. And I mean, and then go with it. Totally. And if people are down, sick. Yeah, that's so rad about the, the, the new age of social media. You can hate on it all you want, but it's giving these people opportunity that may have not had opportunity in the past. Maybe Straight they up. come from a place like we came from and it was a little bit trickier for us to make it, but I think it's equally as tricky, but it's easier to get yourself in front of people nowadays with social media. And um, you just got to be a unique personality and show yourself and instead of trying to be like the rest. And yeah, exactly. I think there are those select few people that are making it off of being neat and, and getting respect from their peers. Exactly. So what was, did you watch all the videos that came out this year? I mean, are you drowned out by the social media craze too? Like even you, you grew up in a time when you would watch a video come out, you know what I mean? Whether it's Aaron Bittner in a Mac dog movie, like following me around, like you said, or any like Lucas Magoon in a tech nine movie, those weren't just coming out every, you had to wait a full year for them to come. So yeah. it'd be literally like 11 months of you building up psych to get a new video 
now you're on your phone and you watch, you know, your favorite skater, you know, you watch every trick is coming out. Then you scroll down and every single big wave surfers killing it in this contest today. And then you roll down, you the one or two moto dudes you follow, do the craziest thing. Then there's like, you know, you're seeing it all within the hour, it's, it's, which is so bizarre. It's insane to see that much talent just by a flick, like you're sitting there waiting at an airport like well you probably do this all the time and you're sitting there to wait wait to catch a flight and it's just like you're scrolling and every single thing is insane you're drowned do you still find the content. time to watch any of the videos yeah and i think i think it's almost ready to come full circle again because there's there's always going to be that social craze and all that and i think it's finding a new new way to hype a big project and and you see it with really 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 good good projects they'll do a good job with marketing and not leaking everything but at the same time is it i'm trying to figure this all out is it worth holding on to things or should you just be exactly that guy that people can't wait to watch your instagram Ex i don't know no I, one knows i, I think it's such I, a weird world i'd like it to come full circle and i i hope it will just because i i love the I love premieres. I love when people get together for a video and it's everyone from like you to kids down at Seymour at Mountain Mountain, like Matt Heenahan's crew all gets together. And then, you know, the weekenders, whoever, the man, and everyone comes together to watch a video and you're not doing, you're not playing on your phone. You're watching, your, your undivided attention is in a big screen and you're appreciating these people who filmed video parts still. And it's but like all their work. I mean, the reason you got to where you are is not only from being inspired by the guys winning contests, but by watching people's video parts. And I, mainly I, the video. I, parts. I think that to me, maybe I'm old school, you know what I mean? But my whole era is going to be the team manager soon. And I think that those are the dudes that are still going to have the undeniable appreciation for somebody going out and filming a full video part. And I hope that aspect of snowboarding doesn't die due to social media because I think it has a lot of importance and it, a full video part, you get to kind of showcase your personality through it. You know what I mean? Like the Lucas Magoons and stuff like that. You can like reek your, or like dope, you know what I mean? You can make your vibe shine so crazy in like, in your video part. Yeah. I think it's a really tough, tough place right now, but I think the people like, team managers or coaches are grinding it into these kids that love snowboarding so much and sh telling them how much work really goes into it and showing them what you should be respecting and what what's just another clip on Instagram so to speak. So I think I think it could come full circle but right now it's just tough. You need to you need to tell these kids and these podcasts are great or it may be us talking in the videos that this is so rare and people put a lot of work into a part all year and yeah you'll see them on social media but that's really what they're proud of is their video part so totally. i think that's something to be said is kids need to know how how much work it is and how proud people are of that and not judge it the same as an everyday instagram clip i cannot tell you how much i like i I love that you are the, I mean, you are, you really are the, you're the forefront role model. You are like snowboarding the pinnacle of it, whatever. You don't have to think that you are, but you are, you're at the very, you're at the peak of it. And you shine so much light on like the respect of like filming a backcountry part and filming like rail. Like if you just deemed that not being cool in social media and everybody who had the biggest like following was just like that stuff's out the window, it would probably ripple effect into that not being as important. And the fact that you guys still, you and everybody else who's doing that still, like Sage, everybody's going out there and filming these banging video parts. It like still translates to the team managers being like, oh, that's clearly what, I mean, Burton is going to, they're making a movie this year. Am I correct? Yeah, exactly. That's First amazing. Time that time in five and the, years. And that's, that's a request from Jake. Jake wanted that. We have a rider catalog now. We're not shooting Abercrombie and Fitch catalogs anymore. We're not doing that we're we're full about the riders for the riders and we're doing all these things and that's what I'm so grateful for with my time with Jake because that's what I stand for and I would grind it into his head and he knows that like that's what Craig Kelly was doing that's what Terrier did that's what we all tell Jake and he was always the guy to listen and yeah there's a lot of board members and people speaking whatever whatever but that's really the 
that's really the clinical program that works. That's what Straight you up. need to do. You can't you can't fix something that isn't broken. We need to come together as snowboarders and be for snowboarding and and um, appreciate the history and continue the history and carry on the legacy that brought us all into the sport in the first place. Exactly. And you go out, like, I look at vans, like, they they clearly put such a strong value on, like, they make landline. They, it's co- the landline costs so much money. Did the, did the return turn into, like, how much money the video and the premiere taught? Like, who knows? You know, but pro- authentic who knows, marketing but to them, goes a long, long way. Exactly. And if you authentically market it, maybe the video doesn't give everything back to the brand, but people eventually buy that brand because of the impact that video made on them or the impact that that tour of the riders going around the world and interacting with people exactly. does. Because, yeah, you can see them on social media, but they want to meet you. They want to talk to you. They want to watch your video part. They want to go to the premiere, watch the video part, but also be able to high five you. And real life interactions, it's all about being real. And sometimes it's just a facade on the internet. Exactly. I mean, I'll never forget when the forum team, they actually did a Winnipeg stop. It's and like, Regina. why that was it? A... I got to meet Travis Kennedy. Yeah. The best <laughs> yeah my Travis life. Kennedy, dude. They, exactly. Those dudes Devin came into Walsh Winnipeg. Was at the local for the, bar. It was for the that premiere. And they we all went to the bar with them. People snuck in. Every single per. I mean, obviously everyone at the Hill was already obsessed with forum, with Jeeves riding for them and stuff. But it just put that like, everyone was buying forum stuff even more. You know what I mean? And we were the kids at our local hill that whether or not like we like to admit it at the time, but we we were the the cool kids that were making video. We were the little gypsy mob crew at Spring Hill Winter, Winter Park making like little videos and that each one of us was going to a different high school and every kid was like, oh, that's Jody, that's Jake, that's Jeeves, that's Kevin Griffin, that's Derek. Those guys are buying, you know, they're buying forum stuff. They're buying wildcat stuff. Like that's what's cool. It's and it would trickle into this huge, effect. this huge like – Everybody at the whole school started buying forum stuff because we were, if you wanted to be attached to snowboarding, which snowboarding is a cool image, people would buy it. Totally. And that's, that is the ripple effect. You want to, every kid has someone to look up to, even if it's on a smaller scale. Yeah. You know, JP Walker, but you know, the guy that's really good that rides for the shop is riding his stuff, then they're going to want to ride that stuff. Exactly. It's fully just a, a food chain. And that needs to stay. And I think brands that are really standing out like Burton and Vans and even K2, like the, the brands that are doing that are succeeding. Authentic marketing is here to stay. Exactly. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think that the the people who are, you know, they hire these like big dudes that, you know, they graduated for Harvard, Stanford, whatever, like those kind of places, they come into like clean house, look at their budgets and be like, okay, like, why are we paying this so much? Why are we allocating this kind of budget into video? Why are we paying these guys so much? Why do we have a full-time video? Why do we have a staff photographer? It's like, those people are so important. Like staff photographers and staff video people, so many brands are cutting those out, but they need to be implemented even more because those are the dudes that shape your whole image of your brand. I know they're they're just as important as flipping the CEO at times, you know, because these brands are that when you when you like cut it down to the core those are the people that are convincing the buyer to come to that brand and it's 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 everyone has a place in a brand but those the athletes and the videographers and the photographers are somewhat the core and they're the ones that are out there and they're the ones that are getting people hyped on the sport and i think people are understanding that more and more at companies and it's a good thing to it's a good thing to see yeah and i mean like and paying them enough i look at people like a lot of people who are shooting photography and videos like especially in this era because they are in this weird like time frame where it's like our our brand's gonna keep paying me to do this and a lot of them you know lose their jobs and stuff but i think it should be the opposite they should be you know allocating a certain budget to those people because those the people behind the scenes are always the different difference makers to me. It's like the people like Blotto, the people like Scott Surface, the people like Colin Adair. It's like each one of those had a big like call like 
Colin Adair, he was shooting like, you know, Aaron Bittner and all the like Larry and Ika for so long. And he helped shape all those dudes careers. And then Scott Surface with like filming with like Travis Rice and Mark Landvik and Ejack and John Jay. It's like that dude made those guys careers. And it's like those names. I feel like I think that a lot of people don't put a high enough value on the people that are on the back of a snowmobile all day shooting the photos and no one wants to pay 500 bucks for that photo. It's like if you want a photo of John Jay doing a crayol off of a huge pillow in Alaska, it's like those that's not free. You know what I mean? Like if you want your whole ad campaign and your whole thing to be free marketing on the hill with kids doing back lips at like, you know, Mount High and Mount Seymour and at Bear, it's like then that's going to ripple into like that's what your brand's going to look like. Or you're going to have a photo of yourself or whoever doing a giant method off of a step down and people go like, oh, I want to do that. Yeah, I think I think that is a really valid point. And it's maybe in my mind for certain brands coming back to that. And I know, for instance, I can only speak for the brand that heavily represents me as Burton and I heavily represent them. And with us making a movie, how many flipping videographers are going to be employed this year because of that? That's, that's, we got to keep the industry alive with doing stuff that kids that snowboard are going to be stoked on because at the end of the day, we're making snowboard product. All I hope for this Burton video is that Mikey Rents gets a rap song. I've always wanted to see Mikey, like, we, I mean, if you haven't checked it out, make sure you check Powder Hounds Volume 1 and 2. Um, the intro, uh, Mikey used an ASAP Ferg song, and there's, like, a snowmobiler doing this hill climb, and he doesn't make it, and he gives, like, the, like, rock and roll symbol when he gets to the top. And, like, I, lo- I talked to this young kid who was on this bald face trip with us, Sean Miskman, and he was like, I've watched the Powder Hounds movie probably, like, 20 times. And he was like, and I was like, I can't, I hope Burton uses a rap song to represent like Mikey and and not use like a classical rock just because he's a backcountry dude. Because I think that going back to the like the Lucas Magoon and stuff like that, the Mikey's style is rap music. Like if you ever hung out with Mikey, he's listening to rap twenty four seven. He's a he's a he's a product of Trevor Andrew. Oh yeah, and that's facts right there. And I think. From what I know, Burton in this upcoming project is going to be listening to the riders like they always do, but more than ever. And That's I'm a- so fucking excited. I mean, I'm, dude, same thing, like other wavelength, like K2, they're making a full project this year. They've never, I think they made one in like 1991. I forget what the first movie, but like, I don't think they've made one since. And with signing Pat Moore and they have Belzil and Jay Kuzik and Mark Wilson and Parker, they have Yourself. like- they have the team to do that. And I'm like, okay, you have the backcountry dudes like Curtis and stuff on the team. And then I'm like, you, this is the time to do it. And it's like, yeah, it's going to cost a lot, lot of money. But I really think that they will see those dollar signs. They were, they're were they going to see that return on the, that investment. And I mean, the right ROI, people. ROI, baby. Yeah, baby. That return, return on that investment. ROI, baby. Yeah. We That's see we're growing up about. here. And um it's it's coming like like I said I think it's coming full circle and we're seeing signs of it and that's that's a really light note. Yes. So Burton, you're on it. You're heavily involved. Who are some of the guys that are your favorite to film with? Like a few backcountry dudes, and then when you're doing contests, who who's got your eyes? Just a few shout outs. I'm, yeah. I'm curious when to I, know when I'm when I'm around the contest scene. I love being around. Um, Danny Davis is a guy I always stand stand for and stay with he's he is a snowboarder through and through he's probably one of my biggest inspirations to this day always has been a hero became a friend type shit and then dude his trick selection is off the charts yeah, he's like revived half pipe riding favorite half pipe <laughs> rider yeah it's like he is making half pipe so damn cool again along with Ben Ferguson, along with Darcy Sharp, along with Mikey Cicerelli. There's so many names that I could name. Those are just a few. And I love being around them. And then if I'm going to be in the backcountry, I love to be around Terrier for sure, Mickle for sure, Mikey, Mark Solers. There's The list goes on and on and on. I love that and you're so involved with like the whole team. It's like you didn't even have like a list of one. It just seems like that whole team is like a family to you. And yeah, that's pretty and special. Everyone's valued the same like i i i have so much respect for every single rider in the world 
but to to share the team aspect that Burton has and how we all get together so much throughout the year and um you see that ripple effect like vans for instance you guys were on that whole trip for like a month in that rv that's what snowboarding should be and it's totally coming full circle and it's making me happy to be a part of it i've been doing this for 12 years professionally and i've never been more excited on the current state of snowboarding and where it's likewise heading. so cheers to that yeah dude straight up it's like i think it's there's some you could easily say like oh, there's a lot of shit that's going on that's kind of funky. But I also think that we're like working through the kinks and people are figuring out like what it is that's important. And it's nice. Well, like I said before, it's nice to have you at the forefront of it to like help emphasize the importance on those things. Because I mean, I mean, everyone's different. And, and, and Sean White in his own respect, I mean, he was just doing his thing, you know, to him, he was accomplishing his own goals. But like, he wasn't as involved as in the snowboard community as, as someone like yourself. Like I see you rolling up in the lift line here at Whistler the last few days. And you have a, you, you talk to Mark Sollers the same as you talk to Derek Malinsky, the same way you talk to Rob LeMay at King Snow or E-Man. It's like, you know, all those people and to remember people's names is a big thing. And I would say, um, you and dude, it's so cool when somebody achieves the light and the stardom that you have. And you still remember like the small guys from like the Hills, like us, it's like, I always, I just have so much appreciation for like that, that you have an importance. It's, it's important to you to like be involved in all the aspects of snowboarding and not just your own little tunnel vision. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, just like Sean was to me, it was like when he was the biggest there for like those four or five, six years and rightfully so, I mean, holy shit, he was sick, but like, you know, doing his own training by himself and stuff. And then to see you, you're out there just as competitive, but intertwined with everybody. For sure, you have your mental focus and you have your goals and you want to win, but you're riding with everybody. You're hanging with everybody. You're going to the parties with everybody. You're you're so involved in all the aspects of snowboarding. And I just find that so fucking dope. I'm just, Thank just you, down Jamie. with the way that, that that's like, it's just nice to have somebody who's out at, in the front and has that appreciation for all walks of snowboarding. And I mean, as it always should be, but like I said, no diss on Sean. Sean was just doing his shit. And I've always like, since the White Album, him gap, gapping onto those huge boxes with uh, Hakey Sorsa, I think. I mean, he was just doing his thing. But it's nice that you're doing your thing and your thing to me is just uh, just like a stronger value to the overall um, well-being of our, the sport or whatever you want to call of Borden. Thank you so much, Jode. I think First and foremost, I have a lot of thanks to give to my family for raising me the way I did. And it doesn't matter how big you are, you need to be giving thanks and involving everyone and sharing sharing the life that I get to lead, you know, is so important to me. If I went off on my own path, sure, I could have all this stuff, but I could have all this stuff and share it with everyone and what makes me feel better sharing it that's just the way i was raised and that's the way snowboarding is supposed to be it's a community and community is the strongest word i can use to represent what we all do and we all have so much respect for each other and the day that goes away then your peers don't respect you yeah and then that's the downfall of it like once you don't have the respect by your peers it's like well then what is over. it then you know you're just doing it for this hollow purpose but like if you're doing it for more than you and it's important, it's important for you to be respected by the community. That's just like, that's just you just seeing right. That's all I really care about. And I think about that all the time and all my, all my business decisions and snowboarding industry decisions are always checked by me thinking about what are my peers going to think? And that is so crucial to me and it means everything to me to be respected by my peers. So that's never going to change. And I think that's why big companies respect me a lot and why Jake respected me as much as he did is because I wasn't just an individual athlete trying to only do good for me. I really cared about everyone and everyone that would ever come in my presence, I would do everything I can. Any rider that hadn't even met Jake or like they didn't have a relationship, all I would try and do was alley-oop them. 
because yeah. Jake really, really loved that about me. And that's what makes me feel whole is giving other people opportunities along with furthering myself as a person and an athlete and a snowboarder and as a businessman. But at the same time, this is what we do. And this is the core of our community. And if you're not going to be a part of that, then your time in snowboarding is over. I love that. That's amazing. Thanks, Couldn't agree dude. more, dude. So so well spoken. Oh, thanks, you take a course man. on this shit, dude? Like, damn. I've done a lot of interviews, but this is my first podcast, and I'm glad to do it with my homie. Yeah, dude. It's and out, it's like, yeah. so many unspoken things that need to be said, and people need to know this, that, and other snowboarders that are making a good living need to know this, that this is everything and more to me. Yeah, there's there's nothing. There wouldn't be much fulfillment in just a solo path, just a me, me, me aspect. Eventually you would be me, me, me with all your all your jewels and all everything you've always thought. But like I mean, I have so many friends that have accomplished other things like outside of snowboarding, you know, and in, in New York doing their own things and, you know, ex girlfriends who've accomplished crazy things. And it's really looks like an empty thing when you're at the top by yourself. It's just like, oh, it's just me now. And then you try to regain those like you know the that, crazy that thing that you had before that, yeah but it's, it's like once they're once people kind of got a feel for who you are it's like it's kind of hard to to restructure those things it's like that kind of i don't know totally i've been lucky enough this is kind of off topic but i've been so lucky to have a lady in a totally different industry coco Ho's pro surfer my girlfriend and i've spent a ton of time around surfing which is a way older sport than snowboarding started everything yeah and dude it's unbelievable how much that's valued in that sport and if you're not like that you don't have a sticker on the nose of your board you know and that that really weighs on me a lot and is influential to me that an older sport we're gonna this sport will grow old it's gonna go on forever people will snowboard for hundreds and hundreds of years and it will be more emphasis than ever on that in time to come. That community is everything. And if you're not a part of that community and you're not alley-ooping your friends, then just get out. Well, I think that um, more than any sport, surfing's like that for sure. Especially like, and I don't know much about your girlfriend, but I've heard from like Rasmund goes to Hawaii a lot and like he's pretty embedded in, like Chris has gone to Hawaii for his whole life. So he knows all the local Hawaiians and Kauai, like really well, like kind of family styles, you know, like the chief of, um, not the chief of police, but the chief, the firefighter chief was hanging out with us the whole time, like and with his kids and, and they, family is everything every there. family is so big there. And like to get in is really hard, but once you're in, you're in. And I mean, we were talking about you and Coco and stuff like that. And like her father and, um, her older brother, um, all pro surfers who have such respect on all the islands. And I mean, you really are a product of your environment and you dating Coco, who also values those same things and you being best friends and looking up to Jake and looking up to someone like Danny and looking up to Trevor Andrew and looking up to Mikey and or whoever, and all those people hold a value on it. Eventually that's just like, it becomes, it's like, that's just part of who you are. Yeah. And if you're going to, if you're not, if you're, everyone wants good for themselves, right? But if you're not going to do good for others, then the good for yourself will never come. And that's so important to live by that is if you give, the giving will come back to you. And that's, that's not just in action sports, that's in life. And sure, you can be me, me, me and make a ton of money, but are you really happy? I don't think so. You got to be a part of the community. And if you give you're going to get back. So I think that's a simple, simple model to live or yeah, model yeah, to model. live by. Yeah, that was a great the, one. So what's it like for someone like yourself to go, you start dating Coco. I mean, you've been surfing for, you know, whatever, 10 years, however long you've been surfing for. You've been in the water for a long time, wakeboarding, doing all that. So you going out there and not being the best and just being Mark, the guy who's out in the water for fun. Is that like, and same with skateboarding, you know, you don't have that pressure. You're not in there to be the best. Do you kind of like that when you go into those things to just kind of flop around the water, catch some waves? Or do you find yourself being like, 
kind of want to be really, 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 really good at this too. Fuck yeah, I'd love to be a good <laughs> surfer, and I've gotten a lot better. <laughs> but um, are you doing it's floaters such and a stuff? Good, yeah, I'm floating it up, man. I love um, it. <laughs> it's such a good. It's literally it's the most humbling thing ever, and I think if I don't surf um, for a long time, I like crave that humbling because it's good to not be the best at something. You need that in your life. And I'm not saying I'm the best at snowboarding, but it's, it's crazy to be at the top of something where everyone's watching your every single move, but you go out there and you're just another ant in the water. And I love it. That's, that's really humbling and really good for somebody's soul, I think. And it makes you appreciate what you do for a living, but it's also just really good to be surrounded by people that are kind of in your position in a different sport you really get to see how they act and maybe you would change this or then you can shape your career totally on maybe their their pros or their cons and yeah i really really take um i take inspiration from all walks of life and i try and shape myself to be the most well-rounded person that i think i can be and that's what's also another topic that we're so lucky to be so well traveled we can take we can take inspo from every culture to make ourselves a well-rounded person to be able to cooperate with any single person we ever come across and it's that's true. why we're super lucky and we got to spread that on our crop of youth straight up dude there's nothing better than like when you go traveling and you put yourself in these like situ like whether you go to Japan and you go up north and you go into like those temple towns that the I mean people have been living the same there for like looks like hundreds and thousands of years. I mean like they're literally living in like wood houses, like getting going outside, getting water from a well. Their cows are running around. They look like they're living. It looks like a movie script up there, and the people are so happy they're doing their thing. And then you go to like France and the people are like doing their thing there. And then you go to like Mexico and. You know, you submerge yourself there and then you go to Hawaii and you steal a piece of all those cultures. You come back to somewhere like Saskatchewan. And I feel like even like with my friends, I feel like when I go back, I can help them like relook at life and realize that they're really, they look through a really narrow glass. You know what I mean? They see life really thin. And when I go back, I kind of like to like, you know, play around with their perspectives and be like, well, I think the reason you think like this is because, you know, you're in your small town and when you go to Mexico, you stay at an all-inclusive vacation. You don't really submerge yourself into any other cultures. So you're kind of just, you just think one way, which is kind of a bad way to think because if you put yourself in someone else's shoes, you're probably going to think a lot like them. And it's nice to go travel the world and realize that if you were in a lot of other people's shoes, you would think differently. Totally. And for someone like yourself, who's on the road 24 seven, it's, and then you come back and you can take a piece of all those cultures and be like, I really like the way people handle like those situations there or like, oh, I don't really like those kind of things. I'm not going to be like that. And then, you know. Totally. You got to take a little bit from everywhere. And like you said, we're so lucky to broaden people's perspectives because we've had that privilege to see different sides or how to be or how not to be. And that's something we definitely need to give thanks for. And the fact that we are privileged enough to be able to help others is so cool. So going forward, Mark, are you excited to do, I mean, obviously you are, you're doing the contest thing. Do you think that you have a time frame on like contest riding? Are you just going to do it until, you know, it's not like your cup of tea or are you excited to do the backcountry thing as soon as possible? Or are you excited to just juggle both of them? Like what's, what's kind of next for Mark? Yeah, right now I'm having a ton of fun juggling them, um, juggling slope style and big air competition with free riding even got in the streets this year for the first dude, time in 10 years. I got to say, dude, some of those clips, that was so sick to see you out in the streets, like that cab over 270, like Thank you. a bunch of, like that just- was my, I was most proud of that shot this dude, year. Dude, that was like a full rail shot. Like that was like jib, like th that's amazing that you shuffle X games, you know, even just all the injuries you've overcome. And then you still have time to be like, yeah, I'll go like- Mark or Craig, you want to go out there and film some street stuff? Like, let's do it. And then not even like, you know, do the thing that you think somebody 
no offense, like on Red Bull would do like, okay, I'm going to like go over this burning giant sea rail that's over like the welcome to Saskatchewan sign or some shit. You're like, you go hit like a legit street spot. And I mean, I've told you this a million times, but your trick selection so on point And I mean, so Thank is your you. style. Thank so you that so was a, much. that was a, that was a banging clip, dude. If I walked away with that clip, hot damn, I'd be psyched. I probably would have went to fakey though. I don't know if I would have brought it back. Oh, you would bring that shit back though. No. Um, but yeah, it's so nice to switch it up. And I've noticed that over time when I filmed that movie in motion in 2015, I had my best contest year. And then last year I did that project and I wasn't strictly competing. I was doing all walks of life. I was snowboarding in the streets. I was snowboarding in Alaska. I was riding park and I was competing. Dude, some of that so, line stuff, that back seven. Whew. Thank you. Um, so when you're doing... When you have diversity in any aspect of life, you seem to hit your high note. And I think when I'm not just focusing strictly on contests and I'm doing all sides of snowboarding, I ride better in contests or I do better in the backcountry. And it's nice to just refresh. You know, you got to, you can't do the same thing over and over again. That just gets stale. Mickle said that in the last podcast. That's what he said. He loves to go. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Mickle. Like, before, Same. you know, Mickle's style and everything, since I was a kid, I was like, Mickle bang. And then to have him on the podcast and say, like, I like to go into every year with, like, a different approach, like, whether it's, like, style or trick selection, I just like to, like, look at it differently. I really, I, I think I always did that, but I never really thought about it that much. And this year, I really thought about that. And I was like, I don't really want to go into it the same way I always have, and like, whether it's like what you just said, like mixing it up in the streets a bit more or like, you know, going to Alaska. And for me, I've gotten the um, the go ahead on doing an Alaska trip, I think, with Curtis at the end of the year and um, and uh, and Pat, I'm sure, and maybe Belzil. And then even after Christmas, I think I'm going to go to Helsinki with uh, Jake and Parker and, I'm not, and maybe Mark Wilson or whatever. But saying yes to those things that like because for me right now, I'm like, oh, maybe I'll just ride POW. But like, just like you, it's like, I'm from Winnipeg. I, there's something about me that just loves the streets. You know what I mean? It's just yeah. like everyone, I get drawn to that shit. I see a, I see sure. a box in the park, like a rainbow rail. I'm like, damn, a cab over 27, pretty feisty on that right now. It's like, I don't know that like, I don't think I'm ever going to wrap my head around about just being like a backcountry guy. I think I've like thought about that and thought that's what was going to happen. But there's something that just kind of drags me into all aspects and Dude, Streets I got in your blood, man. Yeah, you gotta dude. have diversity. And I, I wish I could ride pipe more, like straight up. The Whistler Blackcombs pipes, like this giant tube that was like an, on a forty-five degree angle, and it's twenty-two foot walls. I'm like, if they just had like an eighteen foot pipe, I just feel like I would learn how to ride pipe. But they've never, they've always just had that icy giant tube up there, and it's just this terrifying thing. And it's just, eighteen now. So is it eighteen this year? Yep. Okay, well, maybe they did drop it down like 15 or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Just in general, you look at Mickle. He's such an overall snowboarder, and that's what's so attractive, and that's what makes him so solid on his board. You can't do just one thing. You got to – not everyone has the opportunity to do all the things, but you got to strive for it. You got to ride all all sides of snowboarding to be your best. For sure. As soon as you miss – like. I look at uh, one of my favorite snowboarders right now, Arthur Longo. It's like oh, he, he grew up riding pipe and then obviously he can ride rails and j jump and jib and he skates and, you know, I think he tries to surf as much as he can. But like there's something to do with those all around snowboarders that it really all comes together. When you only ride one thing, it's like it's tough to like ride your best. You know, it's like when you're a dude who rides a hip and a half pipe and a quarter pipe and a jump and a rail – you see all terrain in different lights too. Like you're out in the back country and you see like a cool wind lip. You're like, I'm going to back lip that thing. And it's Ooh. instead of just like, oh, I'm going to do another turn on it. You're like, oh, but like maybe I could do like this half cab manual kind of thing and then like do a switch back five off or whatever. You know what I mean? You just look at terrain so differently when you kind of incorporate all aspects of riding. All the things you've learned over the years. And yeah, you need well-rounded makes everything more fun. And like you said, say... You rode a lot of rails, you rode a lot of pipe, and you rode a lot of park, and then you want to just ride backcountry for a season. All that stuff is going to implement into that backcountry season. You got to take from your bag of treats, you know, you got to 
take what you've learned and implement it elsewhere. And that is what snowboarding is all about. Bag of treats. I got. I got to know. Get your Halloween bag. Get out. your Halloween bag ready. Okay, your Halloween bag. You're, you're you're probably like all of us. You got your two fingers. You're sitting on a plane and you're pretending you're doing back lips with them and nose blunt pretzels. You know, you got your tech uh, every, your tech deck fingers out. Like, what what are some tricks this year that you don't normally do that you would like to do? Do you want to do like switch back rodeo nose grabs? Do you want to do you know switch back tails? Like, what are some tricks that I've seen you up? We we did a few laps the last few days and I seen you at the cab seven tail. I mean, obviously. You, I feel like you're one of the few people that can, like you said, the power of mo- uh, manifestation. You can kind of do anything you want. But like, what are some tricks this year that you kind of have your eye on? Maybe that you're not the best at, or that you want to try. Um, just from what I've done in the backcountry in the past, usually right landing um, regular. Don't do a lot of switch landings in the backcountry, and that's a huge goal of mine this year. I want to land switch in the pow more. Because I know I can do it, I just end up going with what I think I'm going to land, and that's usually cap you nine, your switch back nine, stance, switch right? back five, totally. So I want to definitely implement that, and I also want to get back to Alaska and ride some big ass terrain again, and <laughs> um, ride more lines and do that natural freestyle thing. Like we didn't, we didn't pat a single thing down when I was in Alaska, and. It was kind of stressful because we were filming a show and I'm like, I'm literally going to get nothing. But Travis was like, nah, let's just ride this stuff. Look at these mountains. And it ended up working. And I just can't wait to create more with that. And that was so rewarding to like do a switchback five off a natural wind lip. That feels so good. You know, like that kind of stuff. And you have one of the best switchback fives. Thank you so much. That feels just as good as doing a triple cork. Like, that's why I know I'll snowboard forever and do it like at a high level is because when a front three in a line is just as hard as the hardest trick I can do in a big air contest, that makes me happy because I'll have longevity in maybe not as a pro snowboarder, but I'll be able to push myself and do things that are hard for me without putting my life on the line, so to speak. Yeah, dude. I mean, like, you can start riding line switch. There's not a lot of people yeah, that do that. There's so many <laughs> things in snowboarding. There's dude. so many. There's there's something for everyone in this sport, and that's what makes it so great. I'm glad you're uh, talking about snowboarding in this cast because snowboarding is literally the best thing out there. And it's, I'm so it's, thankful that this is my life. Oh, it's the best, dude. I, I totally agree. Going into every year, I'm always just I, – I feel like when the season's over, I'm like, oh, okay, am I going to do another, like dedicate my whole life to this again? Like, and then you know, I look at my sister. She's got kids and my girlfriend's you know, got her work going on. And then as soon as I strap in and I just go and then there's like a little roller and I kind of ollie off it fast and then land on my toe edge and then do a nice toe side turn out of it, I'm like, why would holy I do fuck, anything why else? wouldn't I do this yeah. forever? This is the best. Yeah, that's so sort of what we all live for and whatever makes you happy, really. But anybody that snowboards gets what we're talking about. And anybody that hasn't snowboard that's listening, you got to try it, man. There's nothing that makes you feel more free. You can't think about a single problem in your life when you're riding. And that's why we all do it. So when you were on the come up, you start killing it. You start doing well. So you get some dough, you know, you win. How many X Games medals did you have? 16, 17 with Craig? I got 17 by myself. You got 17 by yourself and one with your brother. Craig. So together, you got but, 18. Uh, yeah, I got. I need one more to tie senior white. So you got all this dough coming in, you know, the kid's killing it. You know, I, I mean, like, who are your sponsors right now? You're on Burton, Oakley, Red Bull. Do you still ride for Sports Check? That- Skull Candy, no sport check right now. Um, new CEO doesn't think they need athlete marketing, which is fine. You never know. Could always come full circle. I've been very grateful with my time with sport check. They've been super good to me. And um, But I, I still got RBC on board, which is dope. And you got your Infinity game. Yeah, um, which is looking to make another. Dude, you guys got to – you played skate We're growing up. You got to make it a bit more skate. I know, but you like that Ollie feature, right? Like, come well, on. Well, dude, the feature – main... it's dude, the game is good, and the graphics are pretty sick. 
but I just it's feel like it could be that it could be forty percent more budget, amp too. Man. <laughs> you need that melon, that crooked cop. You need that like. I know, just... I know. We're gonna get it. We're dude. gonna get it, dude. Get me in the green screen, dude. Ah, oh, sorry, my <laughs> my hamstring just cramped. <laughs> oh yeah, dude. Because Jody's <laughs> giving me too much shit about my video game. It's gonna be the death of me. <laughs> no, no, the game's incredible. Thanks. So you got all these brands. You start crushing. You start making some dough. What What was the first time someone told you that you should do something smart with your money? I mean, like, eventually. You got athletes need to make. I don't care if you're in the NHL, you're in the CFL, you're you're crushing it, NBA, whatever. You're making dough. Like you got to make some plays with it. So, what was the first play you feel like? Did you buy stocks when you were a kid, or was your first thing the house that you bought in California? Like, why did you start moving your money around so you could have a longevity, so you and Coco Ho can you know Say crush it forever? <laughs> um, I'm just curious because I feel yeah, like there's not first, enough light shine on. Like snowboarders yeah, yeah, doing yeah. something with their money because totally. everyone just like, you know, makes a bit, they buy the truck, they buy the sled, they put the big sticker on the back of the truck. So they look kind of cool driving around, you know, wherever it's Salt Lake, Whistler, woo, I made it. And then they're broke and then they're, you know, laying bricks for the rest of their life. So. Yeah, that's not my plan. I've, um, well, first and foremost, the smartest thing I did was hire a super gnarly financial team. There you go. Um, I got KPMG on my side and they've been unreal with obviously like not fucking up with taxes and all that. And then I have RBC private banking helping me with stocks, investments, everything. Do you own any Tesla sun. shares? I do not. Oh, I was out of curious. I was Tesla is a, not a place I need to be invested. Nice. But I'm, um, that's the only thing I'm, I'm no, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm like a 10%. I think it's really cool Tesla and I think it's not a bad idea. It's just, I'm going the super safe route. And then I'm with, you know, like I'm taking these chunks and I'm putting them into things I believe in and I can have my hands in. I don't want to just buy into Tesla and not have any say in it. I, if I'm going to go into something, I want say in it because everything that I've been able to think about and have my hands in has worked and I want to continue that. Like if I can have some sort of say on the outcome, I think it's going to work. And I believe in myself and I'm manifesting that shit. Yeah, B. And um, I got a tequila company going with Taylor Steele, the super legendary surf filmmaker. What? Uh, What's it called? Salento. Salento? Yeah. Dude, you're starting a tequila. Are we drinking that? Um, yes, sir. We are? Oh, yeah, dude. This is the best tequila I've ever had. Yo, you Shut gotta try up. this shit out. A, you don't need to fucking <laughs> give me that. Um, but it'll be, it'll be up here soon. Um, but I'll keep bringing bottles up for the boys. Um, but I'm also just had some really neat opportunities with people I've met along the way. And that's another thing for me, like 50% of how you act and 50% of how you snowboard. And if you can create those relationships and be a guy that people want to be around and people want to be involved in business with, shit's going to go your way. Nobody and, wants to do business with like some boring dude they can't like have a, a guy beer that with. acts like a crazy dirtbag snowboarder. It's fun to be fucking a snowboarder, but be, be a nice guy. Be cool to everyone. Doesn't matter if they're a snowboarder. Be, be open. Be op open for opportunity. Be, be optimistic. All that stuff is so huge to me. And, um, I want to, I want to be able to snowboard for the rest of my life and never have to do quote unquote, a real job. Yeah. That's why I try so damn hard. I want to be able to go up and snowboard any day of the week. If I, if I want to, you know, like I never want to have, it would be to... heartbreaking if in 10 years you got a job with like, you know, me and Rube and E-Man painting in the summer. Well, I'd no, like, that's not Martin. heartbreaking at all. <laughs> I'm just saying I've had such great success in snowboarding that I don't want to I don't want to let it go. Like you guys have had great success, but you want to continue snowboarding. Fucking so right. You're, so you're you're keeping that dream oh, alive. Oh, we're doing what, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You got to do what you got to do. But if I'm making this dough, then I want to continually make dough and be able to support others, support athletes I believe in, make investments I want, be able to own homes to host people that like to snowboard so they can come up to Whistler. Like this snowboard. beautiful home in, we're in right now. Yeah, baby. This let's thing's go. new. When did you buy this pad? I bought it in November of last year. How much that bill cost you? 
too much to ask. If too you asking, it's too much. <laughs> Motherfucker. No, I'm just kidding. That was the tightest shit you said. Yo. <laughs> that was dope. Oh, we have fun. We have fun. No, no. This, pla- um, this pad is no, sick, dude. But the, the, so the, the, we got heated pads. Like, we're in the basement. So we're right now. Like, you got to turn the heat on these We got room. people upstairs sipping Solento. Oh, yeah. we got Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're having a good time. They're being nice and quiet. They're being respectful. So who, who do you got roommates in this place or is it just empty? Nope. Um, I got my brother. Big bro, Craig, who's actually been a huge advocate for me being professional and making the right connections and doing things because Craig's had to work in that business world. He works for ESPN. He works for CBC. He he deals with people that aren't snowboarders. And even if they're clueless to what we do, you can't shame them for that, right? Straight and up. And he's so good at that. And I've taken crazy note. He's a huge inspiration to me, my brother. He owned two homes in Whistler before I could even blink my eyes, you know, like he's done so good for himself. And um, now he's renting them and he's living here. And and then um, Russell, who films me, Russell69, you may know him from Instagram. His full name's Russell Chai, like a dirty chai, chai latte. <laughs> um, he's got lots of li- nicknames, but he's also living here and it's so good. And we keep this downstairs suite for the homies that come through. And yeah, I think property's the safest bank account in the world. So Straight I'm up. just trying to do it. I'm not trying to flip these homes and sell them. So the market will dip. You got to know that, but, um, it's always going to come back around. And so hold dips, on to dude? your property. Yeah, you hold on to this. Do you got a place in California too? And you spend where do you spend most of your time? Probably in the California place. Um, like home wise, yes, in California. But most, the majority of my time is spent in Canada, um, mainly for snowboarding tax purposes. Yeah, and for snowboarding. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, I do a lot of competing in in Colorado and a lot in Europe. You do a lot of competing in general. Yeah. <laughs> you live in Cali most of the time. Who do you hang out with in Cali? You're with Ika. Like who else is, who's your crew down there? Um, Casey Feitler is my roommate down there. He's my only roommate and I got to thank him because he keeps a really good eye on the place. He keeps and it tight. Yeah, exactly. Keeps it tight. And my family lives in Saskatchewan now, but Um, I'm so thankful to have these properties and I'm so thankful to have cool parents that believed in me to do what I want to do. Hell yeah. We don't come from a wealthy family by any means, but they're so supportive of me in the sense that they let me miss school. They let me follow my dream. They didn't make me go get a job or do this. You know, they, they sought out my dream. They knew you had a master plan. They knew it, man. (laughs) They believed me, even though if they didn't know it, they believed in you. They saw it in my eyes. And the fact that they're able to come out here for Canadian Thanksgiving and use my home. And now they're down in Cali using my home. And that's like the most fulfilling thing. That's the way I can say thank you. And that makes me feel really good. Um, and when I'm down in Cali, um, if it's not with the folks when they're there, I usually hang with Ika a lot. Ika Backstrom, huge, huge G. One huge of my fan. best friends. Blake Paul lives with him a lot of the times. Aero Nimala, who is also an amazing snowboarder that spent a ton of time down here or up here. Um, and then, yeah, just so many action sports folk out there. Todd Richards. Todd Ritchie. Hang with a lot of skaters. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm immersed in action sports and see all these stars from hey, different sports. Speaking of, of action sports, I follow Dan Balzerian just out of curiosity what that dude's up to. I saw a little edit he posted the other day, and it was like a party, super crazy. Like I think it might have even been a Halloween party. Sean White and Nigel Houston was there. Where's your invite, B? Dude, the invite's open, but that's not on brand for Sparky. Dude, you inv- I don't you- believe in that shitty marketing. <laughs> that guy's a kook. Is he a kook? In my in my eyes. I've yeah. only listened to the Dan Balzerian Joe Rogan podcast. He's a womanizer, he's a piece of shit for sure. I'm not a he's big a great advocate. businessman for sure, but I don't I don't b- believe in his terms of marketing. That's not authentic marketing. 
Yeah, he's a terrible person. I was just curious about the party because it looked dope. I mean, it did. Oh, it like everyone it. would like to be at a Dan B party. But wait, <laughs> if you have a girlfriend, there's no way you're allowed to go to a Dan B party. Yeah, that's true. I, I have a girlfriend. I was just curious maybe at the time you were single and, uh, you know, maybe if you get an invite next year, we maybe. could get like Sollers. You know, Mark's single. Maybe he, yeah, he could take your ticket. Yeah, let's send Sollers. Well, like, he's Mark, so he can go <laughs> on my phone. invite. How about that? Uh, there you go. Mark, I have to say thank you so much for coming on. I know we both got stuff to do. I got to pack. I'm going back to Winnipeg. You're going to a contest in a few days. King of the Hill, baby. I'm, I'm, I'm going to King of, of the Good Hill. Job. You're going to a Red Bull contest. I hope you win. I hope you have the best season. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much you. for being on. You're a total G. And uh, all of snowboarding, thanks you for, for being who you are. You're, and I thank you're the snowboarding shit, B. for keeping me, guy, or keeping me going. And literally, my main reason to snowboard is for the happiness of myself and to stoke others out and to be an inspiring person across the board because I'm inspired by a lot of people and I can vividly remember being a kid and being so damn inspired. So thanks for having me on to chat. You bet. Everybody, thanks for tuning in. Be awesome. Be a nice person. Happy Christmas. Merry Christmas. Whatever you say. Peace. Have a great day.